and we are recording. So, Joan, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I, I really, truly appreciate it. We tried once before. Um, one of our computers wasn't working, but thankfully, seeing as you're a busy guy, that we were able to find some time and make it work. So, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, um, so, you want to start maybe by just giving, you know, not everyone might be as familiar with you as I am, just a little brief history into kind of what your background is. Yeah, so hopefully you can hear me good. My computer's having issues again. Um, I can hear you great, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm actually a real estate agent the past three years, um, but I own, I'm also a real estate investor since 2009. Um, and I was also in banking as well. So I had the financial background with that. But um, yes, 2020, so I have a real estate team. There's about seven of us, so seven of us now. And then again, I've been doing the real estate investings um, for almost 11 years now, wow. all in Las Vegas and maybe two houses in the Midwest. So, Really cool. Really cool. So it, may, it might be interesting to talk a little bit briefly about, you know, because we focus on real estate here, about your banking. How long were you in banking for and what did you do? Yeah, so I was actually a private client banker at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was there a little shy of five years. Um, I was there when I first started invest. Or no, I'm sorry. Actually, the first house I bought in '09. I think I got to Chase 2013, I believe. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was there five years. I was mostly de dealing with affluent clients, so I was dealing a lot with the retirement accounts. Um, so that was my main role. Um, I had my license, my sit, my Series Six and Sixty Three, as well. So I was doing that for about yeah, I would say five years. What, what is that that you said the uh, oh, yeah what is yeah, that my, my series six and 63 so that allows you to actually invest for your clients um you know such as a mutual funds um you can help them with with the mutual funds stocks which most most older clients didn't do stocks but mutual funds um help them with their 401ks as well so anything in the stock market i was able to help and trade for them as well so, so in, in a way, you were a financial advisor. Is that what most people, or, or is it a little different? That was the route I was headed to, actually. Okay. So before I left Chase, that was my progression. However, um, actually, my CPA is the one that convinced me to leave Chase. Well, he was one of the parties that convinced me to leave. So he said that financially, it made more sense for me to be a, a professional in real estate. Yeah. Because of all, you know, just tax benefits and everything that comes along with it. And then, you know, family stuff happened. And um, October 17th, 2000, and I think 17 was when I put in my two weeks, worked about five days and was in real estate full time after that. Wow. So, wow. Oh, so that, yeah. that's an interesting transition because obviously, you know, you, you were investing a lot in stocks and and um, mutual funds, bonds, what, what and what not um, for your clients. So, you know, someone who usually is in that field usually tends to prefer um, um, equities to, to real estate. Um, mm -hmm. What made you more interested in real estate? What made you want to transition? Um, I think that's an interesting point there. Yeah. So while I was at Chase, I was actually buying, um, I think we were buying about one property a year while we were at Chase. So, because we were living off one income, right? So we were doing the frugal lifestyle, we're being smart with our financials, and that we were literally every year we were buying a property. Wow. So the year, or I'm sorry, the month we got married, within about 14 days after we got married, we actually closed on a property. So imagine she's planning the wedding, and I'm planning to buy this other house all within the same month. <laughs> so it was a natural progression for us. Um, but again, every year we were buying properties. So obviously you know, being a chase was very helpful, learning all the ups and downs of loans and all that in the entire process. And um, yeah, that was kind of nuts because that wasn't really what we planned. You know, life has a funny way of just guiding us in the right direction. So I think we put ourselves in a great situation financially. And I like to think that we also got lucky as well. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's definitely worked out for you without a doubt. You know, you've just hit the ground running in, in real estate. So 
Do you want to talk a little bit more about where you are in real estate in terms of your career? We'll, we'll get to the investing part a little bit afterwards, but in terms of your um, um, real estate career? Yeah, so um, if this is my third full year in real estate. Um, I feel like I've been in it longer because I kind of have, right? Yeah. Just not being on the writing offer side. But yeah, so we're three years into it and um, we have a small team. Um, we're all still learning, so we have a lot of new new team members on the team, but it's amazing having to not worrying about the money, but just worrying about helping. Right. And I know most agents will probably say this, or actually most team leaders will probably say, Oh, you know, I'm doing it to help people. Well, I genuinely mean that. And it shows in the contracts that my team signs. Right. Cause I believe that having a real estate team, it's, it's really, there's a lot of pros and cons to it. Right. So most people feel like the team leader takes advantage of, of their team members, but our team, how our contract is structured, it's pretty amazing. So that's why I'm happy to have my team. And it's really not my team. I call it, it's always our team because whatever things we want to implement, it's always a vote. I always ask for everyone's opinions, everyone's thoughts. So it's kind of, we all go together on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I couldn't agree more with you. It's like, the more people you you help, the more people, um, the more likely you are to help yourself in a way, you know, yeah. but especially if it comes from a genuine place, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I like to help people, but in reality, yeah. you're thinking about yourself. If you truly help people, which I know you do and your team, I know firsthand, you know, yeah. um, that you do without a doubt. I think it just comes back to you tenfold. And not only that, but you, you create relationships with people mm -hmm. as well. That's so much stronger when they know that you are genuinely trying to help us. So, I yeah, think, I think that's really cool. And I think that's a, a big point that, you know, you keep hearing, but you don't realize how important and how and doing it the right way as well is so important. So congratulations yeah. on that, for that. It, it, it's pretty amazing because I would, I'm just thinking right now that every single person on our team, it's either someone that we know or someone actually did a deal with or I sold their mom's house or their dad's house or their own personal house or it's someone that's a referral from another agent that, that's on the team mm -hmm. so we don't have any quote-unquote strangers on the team as of yet because um, again we're still small but you figured if you sell someone's house or you buy them a house if you did the right thing they'll you know don't know who you are as a person so it's kind of a testament to our team because every single one i've literally done a deal with them yeah so you that's a nice cool. guy then otherwise people want to want to work with you <laughs> i try i try yeah so you've been in real estate, you said three years now? Yeah, going on. So this is my third full year now. Okay. Okay. So that's, you know, most people, when they start real estate as an agent, you know, they're focusing on getting their leads and prospecting and trying to convert those and trying to pretty much trying to get as many deals as they can, you know, from buyers and sellers. But you, you, I guess, have gone a little bit of a different route, right? Especially so early on in your careers to build a team. What was the, the reason behind that and how have you done it so successfully? So with the team, I played sports all my life. So I've always had that team mindset. And I feel like that you can't go as far as you can individually than having a team. So obviously having a team, one, my team pushes me, right? Because there are things I'm like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. I want to do it too. So it's not just about me pushing the team all the time. We actually, I feel like it's more the other way. I feel like I'm being pushed all the time by the team. But um, one of the reasons I chose that route was because I never wanted to be an agent, actually. I wanted to be a business person, mm. right? So being an agent wasn't something that I, was, that I wanted to be. I don't be like, oh yeah, let me be an agent. Let me open some doors and sell the houses. I've always had that I want to run a business. And to run a business, I feel like that you need a good a team or really good solid people around you because that's how you leverage too, right? So I think for me building a team is because I want to build a business. And now I'm teaching my team members how to build their team and how to build their business. So my job is not just to teach them how to be good agents, but I want them to learn how to run a business. And I'm probably the only team leader that would say that one day sooner than later, or sooner than later, you're going to leave me. Right. Because I want them to, or I want them to build a team within our team. Because I think, I mean, like what you mentioned earlier, it comes back tenfold. So if, if I, you know, if I take care of you, then you're going to be successful, right? And then you'll pass that, you know, to other people. 
and that just makes me feel really good. It's, I guess it sounds kind of corny, but I really do feel that. It's amazing having to help people, knowing that, you know, knock on wood, I'm financially secure now. So helping people, it's, it's another way, I guess, that just, I don't know, it's like a high for me. You know, so most people get high off their paychecks, right? They say, oh, I just got paid 10 grand, 20 grand. For me, I don't, I don't feel that anymore. I'd rather have someone else get paid five and I get paid five. And that's a high for me. So that's kind of my mindset around that. That's really cool. That's great to hear. And because of course, we, I'm sure we both know not everyone looks at things the same, you know, but, um, you know, again, knowing you firsthand, I, I know how important it is for you to see other people succeed and to help themselves as well as, you know, your own success. But yeah, that's, it's very important. So if someone was, you know, a real estate agent starting out today, let's take COVID out of it because it's, what is it now, June 22nd, we're still kind of somewhat in the middle of it or maybe at the tail end of it, who knows, but a real estate agent starting out today, what would you tell them? How do you advise maybe people starting in your team and, you know, what should they be doing and, and how can they help themselves to be successful in the business? So that's a really good question. Um, for a brand new real estate, a real estate agent, the first thing I would do is have them get their, their own personal financials in order, right? Because I feel like if you don't have your own personal financial um, home in order, then you're going to make decisions based on your financials, not your client's financials. Mm. So in the perfect world, have some emergency fund, right? Be secure and be comfortable with what's in your pocket. Because I feel like some of the agents these days that they're making decisions based on their income and their commission. That's always their thing about, oh, my commission, my commission, right? I need to get this house sold. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get sold. Well, to me, if you're in a strong place financially, you're going to you make the right decisions for your clients and your clients are going to realize that. Therefore, you're going to build that relationship with them. And this is going to trickle down to their family, their friends. So that's how, to me, that's how you grow your business, right? And making sure you're secure first. That, I think that's, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice, especially for people who want to be in this long term. Exactly. If, you have, if, you're, if you're comfortable in your situation and you don't have to make a paycheck and you don't have to, you know, get that commission, you're not, you're not coming from that place of, you know, trying to force a deal, trying to get someone to sell if they're not ready, trying to get someone to buy if they're not ready, you know, and you're just doing a better job. And long term, you yeah. know, there's no doubt that it's, you know, you want to be the best agent possible for people. And that means sometimes not getting that commission check, but sometimes waiting longer for it or never getting it, but it means doing right by your clients. And I think that's such a, a valuable lesson for people for maybe an agent starting out today that they can do that. So, yeah, 100%. Actually, so two examples. So it's June, COVID hit end of March, middle of March. Yeah, middle of March, I think. So we had two clients that was ready to make an offer or actually, did they have an offer accepted? I think they had their offer accepted. Me, me and my agents actually told them to back out because they were using all their liquid. And not, I mean, unfortunately, literally within two weeks of us saying, you know, hey, let's back out, let's rethink, let's, let's restart this whole process over and you know, figure it out. Both of them lost their jobs. So imagine, you know, closing on a house and literally less than a month later, you lose your your job, both of them lose their job, right? So when we dissected them financially, they were just too, it was just too thin for them. So that made me feel really good knowing like, whew, we just literally probably just saved their family situation, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I can just imagine what would have happened if they used up all their liquid and then they're jobless. Yeah. So. Yeah, because now they've got no money coming in. They can't make the mortgage payment. They're going to be, mm -hmm. they could lose the house, lose all that liquid money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's great of you guys to do that, you know, because not to paint everyone on the same picture, but I'm sure there's plenty of people that would have just pushed ahead with a deal and, mm -hmm. you know, got just got that money and run or whatever. So that's, that's oh, great. Sure. Yeah. Great. As soon as we brought up the subject, it's not something I want to focus on too much because I think there's plenty of other stuff, but seeing as we are talking about the COVID, you know, how, how do you feel? And we are here in Las Vegas. Both of us are here in Las Vegas, you know, uh, give us a little insight on June 22nd, you know, what, what do you, how you feel about the market? What's kind of going on in the residential side of stuff here in Vegas? So I guess it depends on what, what eyes you're looking at, right? If you're a buyer, completely different. If you're a seller, completely different feeling. Yeah. So um, for me, actually, let's see, let me give you an example. So we have a buyer, um, we actually just signed, so we have a buyer and a seller actually. 
So we just signed his house to sell today. So that's official. And he's buying a house, uh, I think it's 520 was what it, came, what it appraised for. We had a hard time um, looking for a house. His, his price point was between five and 700,000. <clears> and we struggled finding a house for him. So the only reason we got this house is because I knew, I knew the agent. So before the, the house was listed on the market, which is on MLS here in Vegas, we actually saw it beforehand. So if we didn't see it, I don't know if we would have gotten the house, right? So it's really interesting that we struggled with it. However, selling his house, his house was listed a little over 300,000. I think we received nine offers. Wow. And this is in the heart of COVID, right? So um, it's kind of, I guess no one has the magic ball or the crystal ball, but it all depends what side you're on, you know? So I know inventory is down by, by a lot here, right? So you can't find houses. There's multiple offers coming back again. Um, also, you factor in interest rates. The rates are now again at an all time low, right? So, I mean, we have investors getting under 4% on an investment loan. <laughs> I personally got 3.5 on my investment properties. And that's an investment property, right? Not a primary. So a primary, you're looking at with, with good everything, let's say, you know, scores income, you're probably at maybe 3.2, 3.3 on a primary. So it's, again, no one really knows. Um, but to me, I just want to give my clients the education, the knowledge and the facts, and then whatever their situation is, they can make the best decision for them. That's why it's good to know what your client's plans are in the future and for today, because we can all just sell houses or buy houses really easily, but if it doesn't match up with their future plans, what's the point, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And that is crazy, you know, I was speaking to someone, I think last week about that, that he got a 3.6 on, on an investment property and I couldn't believe it because it's just, it's pretty much free money, you know, and you've got to factor that in, especially if you're holding this property long term, you know, if your plan is to hold it for 30 years and pay it off, that that interest rate is an asset by itself. Yep. You know, you can't you can't imagine that rates will ever go much lower than they are. Who knows, right? Yeah, who knows? But it's pretty fantastic to get such a great interest rate right now. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, in the middle of COVID, we I personally did six refinances, and every single property was at 3.5. Some of them I had to pay a little bit, but barely, right? So literally during COVID, uh, investment property, we got it for 3.5. So that, I mean, that's a primary rate, right? I mean, it's just, we couldn't believe it either. We were just shocked. My lender is amazing and she, she made it work for us. Our file's really big. So she was able to take care of everything. And yeah, within about, a, I would say less than 60 days, we closed on six refinances at 3.5. Fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, thank You're you. Pretty, pretty happy with that, right? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I was excited for sure. <laughs> so that's a great transition into your investment properties and your investing career, you know, alongside being an agent. You obviously invest quite heavily into real estate as well. Um, how many, what does your portfolio currently look like? Maybe give us an insight of how many rentals you have, where they are. Um, and yeah, if they're just all rentals or if you flip or whatnot. Yeah, so we started, um, my first house I bought was in 2009, that's a primary. And actually the government gave me $10,000 to buy that house, right? So of they course. Gave, and you didn't have to pay anything back for that? No, not at all. Wow. As long as at that time, I believe it's four years or five years, as long as it's your primary for those years, then you're good. Mm -hmm. So really they helped me buy my first house, right? That was in 2009. That house now is literally double the price. I still have it. That's my highest cash flowing uh, property. And that's in Vegas. Um, we have you a total. Might be, you might be asking how much you pay for it and what it rents for now. Yeah, we paid. For, well, the original owner bought it in 2006, right? Ooh. They paid 306 for or 305 for it. We bought it for 134. Oh. Nine or three years later, 2009. Crazy. So, yeah. with that particular property, we kept it. Of course, we made some upgrades to it, right? And um we are getting about $1,600 in rent. My mortgage is, I think, uh, under $800, wow. like 750 something like that. Yeah. So, and again, we're going to keep that property for a long time. My interest rate is 3.3 .3 on that property. So at that time, money was also very cheap to borrow. 
So that particular property, no nine, I actually refinanced it three times already. Yeah, so three, I did it 2010, 11, and 12. So every year I was refinancing it down. So, and were, you, were you doing a cash out refinance or just straight up refinance? You just yeah, just straight out, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, I wish I would have done a cash out refi on it, but I, at that time, I wasn't really into taking money out of the property for some reason, and I wish I would have done it. But yeah, I would just, I would, just, I just wanted to lower the monthly payment. That was my initial goal. But since then, we were able to buy almost a house every single year from 2011, I believe, on. Um, one or two years we didn't do anything because, well, one year we were really busy. We got married and all that stuff, so we bought one house that year. But currently we have nine, um, mostly in Vegas. We we had two in Arkansas. We sold one, so now we only have one left. And we're actually thinking about selling that one, um, probably 2021, maybe 2022. I give her that. It's a it's a little challenging being a landlord, literally, you know, across the U.S. So yeah. Why, um, why Arkansas? I didn't, I didn't realize you had home. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, we love visiting there because we have family there. So my wife's sister actually lives there. Um, and I mean, it's dirt cheap over there, right? So Midwest, a lot of people invest out there. Originally, we were supposed to buy one property. So we had one property locked up. Our agent at that time was like, hey, let's see this other house too, just for fun, right? <laughs> which was not a good idea not a good idea at all so we see it it was a killer deal it was actually a foreclosure and we just bought it so we bought two houses and literally in about three weeks apart wow. and we were supposed to be there only three weeks we ended up being in arkansas almost two months because we were doing some of the work okay not that we had to but we wanted to because we wanted to learn the whole process so we were laying down you know flooring paint I mean, cabinets, we did every, we did a lot of everything in there. So we definitely had a lot of learning experience. Um, you know, we saw vinyl planks in one of the houses, had to take the toilet out. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't a flip or anything, but we did a lot of work. Yeah. So, well, that's great though, because that, that way you learn and you know what goes into a rental property. So then when you, you're not there or you're not doing it yourself, you understand what goes in. So you understand what goes right or what goes wrong or what materials are needed. So things, you know, any red flags, you'll, you'll be able to spot them. So I didn't realize you were that handy. I'll have to get you to come over to my house. I got some stuff I need to fix it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, you know, it's actually my wife is the one that's very handy too. Okay. So, I mean, she was like the measurements for the vinyl planks and she's small. You know, when, when you see us, you're like, oh, they can't do anything, right? But I mean, those, when you carry the vinyl planks out, they're about 80 pounds in the little box. And then we have to worry about carpets. We have, we're carrying the carpets in our shoulders. I mean, we did the whole nine yard for it. Wow. Oh, yeah. fun experience though, looking back, I'm sure. Like, you remember that as a fun time, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, definitely. It was, yeah, but we were there for two months. So a month longer than expected. But, you know, at that time, you know, I had a team already. So we were doing real estate in, in Las Vegas while we were gone for two months. So that was, that was definitely challenging too. Yeah. Well, another great, another great reason why to have a team, right. That, mm -hmm. you know, you can do it remotely and you know, if you have a build, if you build a team, right, you can rely on them to help you out in times like that. No, so the, the two properties again, I don't, uh, if you don't mind, you, do you mind sharing how much you pay for them and how much you get in how you were getting in rent? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So one of them, um, we, it was listed for 90 and we paid, how much did we pay? I think we paid 80 for it. And um, that one was renting out. We had to pay cash um, for both of them. And so that one, we rented it out for about 1100. Okay. That yeah. one we sold already. Um, and then the other one we bought for, it was listed for 90 something too. And we had some, you know, we had some back and forth. We actually backed out completely. And about two weeks later, they came back to us. And um, so we bought that for way cheaper than they wanted it. We got that for, I think, 64. Nice. And then, of course, we put in some work. The first property, we probably put in about 15K worth of work. The second one, probably about less than 10. So we had, so we had foundation issues, which the you know, foundation issues there compared to foundation issues in Vegas is very different. Worse so, or better? Huh? Worse or better? Bigger oh, problem. there. Cause I guess in Arkansas, that's very, um, it's very soft on their land's very soft. Right. Mm -hmm. So they literally just 
put some blocks on the foundation, you know, like putting blocks on your car, right? And that cost us two grand and the foundation was fixed. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, at first, you know, when you hear that, right, as an investor, you see your foundation, you freak out. And then, so that was the first house. The second house, you need a new roof. Again, as an investor, you got a new roof, that's gonna be 30 grand, right? Or however much. Well, the new roof cost us, I think, 5,000. Wow. You know, and again, <laughs> we were brand new there, right? We yeah. didn't know anything about Arkansas. We didn't know a lot of this, what goes into the process over there. Uh, we do know that they're a lot slower. I mean, they move like molasses over there. <laughs> and like there took two weeks to get to us. Everything just takes a long time to move over there. That's yeah. Cause yeah. It, same thing. What it instantly, any structural stuff, I'm like, Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's trouble right there. But two grand to fix it. And then five grand for the roof. Then itself is incredible. How big mm -hmm. were the, how big were the houses? Were they roughly the same uh, size? Yeah, they were pretty close. One was about 1900 square feet. Okay. But that one had almost an acre. No, yeah, two acres. And then the other one was about 1,700 square feet. That one was maybe a little bit smaller than a quarter acre. But over there, land is cheap, right? So land is what they have over there. So, but yeah, it was, it was a good size. The other one I wanted to keep, you know, just for us to visit. But I'm not sure if you've been to Arkansas in the summer. No. Yeah, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's so humid over there. Yeah. You know, here okay. in Vegas, it's dry heat. Yeah. Over there, it's just humid, lots of bugs. I mean, but it's a lot of nature too, because we're camping there. But yeah, you don't want to be there in the summer. Okay. Yeah. Now, I used to live in Florida, so I'm familiar with that. I don't miss, the mosquitoes love me for some reason. They would yeah. eat me yeah, up. So that was nice, you know. Cool, so they, they both really, they both the deals fell under the 1% rule. I'm sure you've had, mm -hmm. you know, bigger mm -hmm. pockets talk about the 1% rule. Yep. So, you know, it just gives you an idea how good cash flow can be when you, you know, you buy the deals, especially in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, you can get some great deals. But the difference with mid Midwest is guess, the appreciation isn't there, isn't it? You know, and I'd be interested, you know, as someone that's so experienced about you, how do you feel about cash flow versus appreciation? You know, everyone's always big on cash flow and appreciation is, is like the icing on the top. But, you know, I'd be interested how you feel about both. So... You're one hundred percent correct. In Arkansas, you you buy property in two thousand and ten for let's say a hundred thousand. You sell in two thousand and twenty, it's about one hundred one thousand. <laughs> so there's really no appreciation there whatsoever. Yeah. So upfront cash flow is really your main goal when you head out there. However, in Vegas, it's a little bit different because we do have appreciation, right? Um, for me, I have to cash flow at least a couple hundred dollars every month, right? Um, the appreciation for us, it's gravy. But we don't rely on it because, I mean, we're still young. We're still in our mid-30s. And these houses we're going to keep for another 20-plus years. So everything we're trying to do, we always said, is, is can it better our lives today? So any deals that we do is can, how can it affect us today? Because, I mean, we're pretty smart about investing for the future. But at the same time, you have to live for today also. Because right? you invest, invest, invest for the future. Well, you can, live, you can die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right? There's so many things that life has planned for us. So tomorrow's not promise. So it's one of those things, any investments we do now is how it's going to help us today. So we're a lot, a lot more aware of cash flow today than we were in the past, but naturally with real estate, as you pay down the mortgage, as, as rent increases, cash flow is just going to increase naturally anyway. Right. And you force appreciation, you're adding value to the house. So you have equity, your equity will grow even more that way. But honestly, for the first couple of years, we didn't really care about appreciation at all, right? I'm sorry, cash flow. Because okay. we didn't really need the money because we were both actively working. We were both working full-time jobs. But now it's, we pay attention to that way more. And that's kind of our number one goal now is just focus on cash flow for today. Because for the future, we have, our future is pretty much set, right? You know, barring any, any, any madness, we're pretty much good for the future. But for today... Can we do whatever we want to do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, do I have to go to work tomorrow? I, you know, I have to examine an appointment, but in general, like, I don't need to, right? Because of the, of the decisions we made in the past, that's helping us now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a fantastic point that, <clears throat> for me personally, um, that I, 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 adhere, I adhere to because 
you know, 401ks and IRAs and everything like that. It's great. It's a great vehicle. Absolutely. But for me, by the time I'm 59 and a half, it's not that I'll be old at that point by any stretch of imagination. Hopefully I'll be, you know, fit and healthy. But, you know, you know, when you retire at that age, you don't need as much money. And, you know, I feel like now I'm 38 now and I'm kind of more in the prime of my life now. You know, I have a nine month old son. Now is the time I'm going to need the money in the next few years a lot more than when I'm that age. So I'm like you, I, I, I like to focus a lot more, have a long term view, but with a short term, you know, shorter term goals, I think is, is, is something that people miss. You know, it's great to invest for the long term, but at the same time, you know, say, say you get a million dollars or $2 million or $3 million when you're 70. Well, how much are you going to enjoy that money the same? You know, you, you know, you might not be as healthy. You might not as much cost in your life, you know? So for me, yeah, that's a fantastic for point sure. again, that, that people, you know, I think it's important to focus on, you know? Yeah. That's more, you know, generational wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Everything for the future, but you're right. I mean, right now we're really big in the fire movement. So we're trying to do everything now. Like, I was watching, like, I was just learning about this couple that retired at 31 years old from Canada. So they're traveling all over the world. I mean, we don't want to be at that, at that stage, but we want to do something like that, right? Maybe half of that. Yeah. Maybe work, you know, six months and then, you know, go do whatever the next six months. Yeah. You're right. Health is not, is not going to, well, as we get older, we're only going to get unhealthier, mm -hmm. right? So today is, is the healthiest you're going to be. So that's what we're trying to focus on now. Yeah. And the great thing, again, going back to the team that you've talked about, if you choose to carry on with that, is that, you know, when you put systems and processes in place, a lot of times the team can run itself. So you could go for three, four, five, six months, like you mentioned, and just be available via email or a few calls here and there and live that lifestyle, but still keep that income coming in as well. You know, because I think it's also important. It's one thing to retire when you're 31, but you know, you've got a lot of living hopefully to do from there. And it's important to have, you know, you say they're traveling, so that's amazing. And they, they might plan to do that for the next 30, 40 years. But for me also, I think it's important to have goals and things to, to achieve, to keep you moving forward. Cause as I think as humans, unless we're developing, you know, we're not, we're, we're going backwards. I feel like. Yep. Uh, I agree with that. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So what is your investment criteria now? And what do you look for now? you know, as we were touching on that. So for us, our, the three last properties we bought, we actually bought all, all brand new. So most people feel like you, well, most people that's not in Vegas would think that you can't invest in a brand new house. We look at it that when you buy a house in 2020, in 10 years, it's going to be, you know, it'll be 10 years old, mm -hmm. right? You buy a house in 1980, well, in 10 years, how old that can be? Mm -hmm. So for us, we, we want to cash by at least 250 a month on there. And not just the cash flowing, but knowing that there's not a lot of headaches that come with it. Because we have other, we have older properties that has a lot more maintenance needed, but now we're trying to transition to getting newer homes. So it's literally running itself because there's not much you have to do on a newer home usually, right? But we've actually gonna, we're actually gonna slow down this year and next year. And we're gonna focus more being in the stock market in the next couple of years. Um, cause real estate, we're pretty solid and comfortable with real estate. Um, but you know, just like with anything, we want to diversify. So we feel like that next two years, we're going to take a real estate break. We'll see, right. If, if an offer comes, I may just yeah. you know, be fortunate enough to jump on there. But right now the game plan is to you know, hold down the four on the real estate side and focus more on the stock market a little bit. Um, but again, we'll see because for us, we kind of do things randomly. So if we see a good opportunity, you know, we do the research and then if it's the right opportunity, then we jump for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's great. Just go with the flow, right? You have a plan, but be willing to adapt and change as you go. I think that's a great point that um, we kind of talked about this before, I think. And, but the, the new build situation, I think is because you, you know, you read on these forums and everything like that. And that's why it's so important that there is no hard and fast rule ever. I don't think it's situational and it's, um, invest individual investor dependent, you know, but for example, here, here in Vegas, you can buy in a fantastic growing new area called Inspirata here, a new build. And, um, you know, you can get a great rent and it's brand new. So nobody's lived in it. You buy it to rent it out and <clears throat> excuse me, buy it to rent it out. And you get, you get what a one year warranty with it. 
what, mm -hmm. what is the situation? So you get a one-year warranty. So for that first year, you know you're going to have no repairs and maintenance whatsoever. You know, nothing's going to break, you know, and everything's brand new. So the chances of you having to, to pay anything to fix anything is going to be so minimal. So whatever you get in rent, minus whatever you have in debt service and whatever, say, if you have a manager in place, the rest is actual cash flow. You can assume, you know, you want to put maybe some aside for CapEx or whatever, mm -hmm. but... For the most part, because it's brand new and it has that warranty, you know, like just like you said, it's you, you don't have to factor in many too many other expenses. And here in Vegas as well, most of it has um, that desert landscaping they call it, which is rocks and dirt. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no lawn care. We don't have to worry about snow. So you know, it, it may only if if you analyzed it via the bigger pockets one percent rule and ran all the expenses, you know, you might be at a point three percent expense ratio. But reality you're gonna have hardly any expenses. And even if you're at a point seven expense ratio, it's like you said, so little headache. Mm -hmm. And it's I think it's a great investment. And especially, you know, you you've got to think that buying in a new build in a great area, pr prices are only gonna go up with something like that. So Yeah, for sure. And here in up here in Inspirata too um, resale actually sells more than new build as mm. far as price point. So we actually did our first flip just earlier this year, right before COVID, like literally right before the city shut down was when we signed our documents. So that was our first ever flip. And I did not use a hammer. I did not do any flooring, no installation of any cabinets, no installing any windows, nothing. All I did was sign you know, dotted lines. So we flipped a new build and when I tell people that story, like, how does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it really doesn't make sense in most places, but up here, there's still enough margin that it, it still makes sense up here. Do you, do you have a theory? Yeah, that's, I, that's <laughs> such a fascinating story. Do you have any theory behind why new builds are cheaper than resale? Um, well, it's slowly been catching up. So I wish I would have done this four or five years ago up here, right? Because the margin was so much greater. Now it's really shrinking because everything is catching up to the new build prices or the new build price is catching up to the resale but um honestly I, I have no idea i think this this area up here is not fully um most people don't know about it yet right it's still kind of hiding i feel like mm -hmm. but um i know there's one other investor that did what we did but there's not a lot of investors i was aware of it if, if you know a place in vegas i can do this again let me know. Um, but it's definitely something that's, it was the easiest flip that anyone's ever going to do. Yeah, it was incredible. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a fascinating story that I was just blown away by. I actually thought about doing it myself, but then yeah. COVID hit. Yeah. 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 It was, um, so it was funny because that whole process was taking place while we were on vacation. <laughs> so at the end of the year, we were gone for about a month and a half. And then beginning of this year, we were gone for like the first month and a half also. So the entire process, I would say 80% of it, we weren't even in town or even in the U.S. while it was happening, right? But um, it was, what do we do to it? We, so what happens was up here, I have really good relationships with, um, with the sales associates. So anytime a deal is about to fall through, I'm one of the three calls they make. So my guy up there, he says he calls three agents and I'm one of the three agents. And every single, every single time he calls me, I can perform. So he obviously, you know, keeps me on, on tap, right? And he called me on this one. And um, within probably three days, I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's buy it. You know, I took a loan out of it. And um, there was a lot of, not a lot, there was still a margin. So um, we, we closed on it, I believe, middle of February of this year. And then it was listed for about 10 days and had an offer. And then um, right before COVID, middle of March, we closed on it. And I think our net was a little under 40000 on it. And But again, I didn't do anything, right? I just signed some documents. If I would have bought that in cash, my net would have been greater because I, had, I wouldn't have all the loan fees and all that, right? All, all the closing costs and all those expenses. But... It was really interesting because that house and an, another investor bought it. To me, I don't think it was a real investor because they clearly didn't know what they were doing, right? So they bought it, they put it for rent, and it's June now, right? It was just rented out two weeks ago. Oh, wow. So it's been in the market for over, almost three months. You know, granted, COVID hit, but it's one of those things where what they were asking for it didn't make sense. 
a lot of stuff they were doing didn't make sense to me at least you know so I mean luckily for us we closed right on time it was literally like the week before everything shut down I was afraid we were going to get shut down and not have a deal go through I was scared the buyers were going to back out but um yeah it was the easiest flip that anyone's ever going to do so you you said you made a net of four zero forty thousand. Yeah, a little bit less, a little bit less than that. Yeah, right. even even thirty thousand, whatever it is, is incredible. So you literally closed, and the day you closed, did you put it right back on the market? It took us. We were actually we were in the Philippines when when all that. So it took us about another week. Okay. To close, and then we had to take pictures and all that. We all took you know professional pictures, but yeah, within about a week, it was listed back on the market for way more than I bought it for. <laughs> And you did zero to it? Nothing. Nothing. I, not, not one thing. We didn't have a washer and dryer in there, no fridge. I mean, it comes with a stove, right? So right. the stove's there. But, but yeah, we, we didn't put any appliances, no window coverings, um, nothing at all. I mean, it's literally, I, I got the key and I passed it over. That's just incredible. Congratulations. That's, oh, thank you. that's how it should be, right? If only it was every deal was that easy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's phenomenal to 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 just close on a deal, turn around and sell it, and make a forty thousand dollar profit. That's just yeah. you, you know you could do that all day, every day. If, if yeah, you were I mean, it's right. totally just signing, right? Yeah, yeah. The pen is mightier than the sword. So, would you say that's the best deal you've ever done? Um, I guess it depends, right? Yeah, because there's so many different factors, right? Um, to me, the best deal we've done is actually my first house I bought in '09. Okay. Because at that time, I was single. My, my agent at that time, she was amazing. Janet, I still remember her name. She actually moved to Georgia. Amazing, sweet lady. Um, so at that time, it was 134, like what I mentioned earlier. And about two months after I bought it, I had two roommates move in with me. My mortgage at that time was about $1,000. This is before I refied, right? So my rate was 4.75. Mortgage was around 1,001, I believe. I had two roommates paying me four hundred dollars each. That's eight hundred dollars, right? Yeah. My rent is a thousand, or my mortgage is a, is a thousand. You know, fast forward a year later, I refinance it down. Another year later, I refinance it down. My monthly dropped to about seven thirty. Two roommates paying four hundred dollars each. So they were literally paying my entire living expenses, all, all my mortgage, right, and then some. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was doing at that time, which I wish I, did, I wish I didn't do this, but I was also paying double payments too. So instead of paying seven thirty, I was paying fourteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have just kept my liquid, so I could have bought another investment property way sooner. But I think to me, that's still my my first deal or my best deal because it was my first first house I ever bought here in Las Vegas, forever actually. And on top of that, the government gave me ten thousand dollars to buy it. <laughs> It's yeah. unbelievable, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's my favorite one. And I'm sure that deal, yeah. So not only was the cash flow great and you, you, you know, the people we're living were paying down your mortgage, but I'm sure it also opened your eyes to real estate investing and proved to you that you can do this and the power of real estate investing. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Because I didn't even know what I was doing until about four years later when I was listening to Bigger Pockets, right? I was like, oh, that's a house hack. I didn't know what that was. Yeah. You know, to me at that time, I had roommates that took me in when I was living on a couch. So they took me in, right? So I was just taking them back in now. I was in a, I was in a situation to help them. So it's kind of, I just, you know, I just returned a favor. That's all I was looking at. Yeah. You know, they gave me a couch and a room. So I was like, hey, so this time you have a bed now or you have a room. So I didn't think anything of it at that time. Huh. Very cool. Very cool. How about the worst deal? Have you, have you had a deal that's gone pretty wrong? Have you been... Um, we've had a couple deals that not, they weren't bad, but they weren't that good. Um, we had a property in Mountain's Edge, which is on the south side of Vegas and HOA, we didn't realize was so high and it kept going up. Mm -hmm. So literally every year, typically your rent goes up, right? So your, your net margin goes up a little bit. Well, in this, in this particular house, it was going the opposite. Oh. Because HOA was increasing. There's two HOAs. So every year we were losing a few bucks. Um, we actually sold that house and we 1031 it into a brand new house here in Inspirata. So we made pretty good equity on that house for sure. But at that time it was our worst performing property. And that's one of the reasons we got rid of it actually. Mm. 
But now we were able to sell that house, which was built in 06, and buy a house built in 2019 at the time. And we literally paid $600 to get that new house. Crazy, so. crazy. So looking back, was there anything that you could have done? Is there any way you think you could have foreseen the HOA increases? Or um, At that time, I was in a stage in my life where I was just trying to get a deal, right? I was so in that mood that I want to get a deal, I want to get a deal. I think all investors go through this phase where they're so adamant about getting a deal and that they overlook all the numbers. And that's exactly what we did. We were too excited. We're like, Hey, let's buy this house. Right. It was dirt cheap at the time. Um, that house we also bought for I believe 125, you know, and then what, seven years later we sold it for 230. Wow. So it's one of those things that I knew was a great deal, but the month to month, the year to year, that stuff kind of bit, you know, it just chipped away at you. Mm -hmm. But the grand scheme of the deal was really, really good because I knew it was going to appreciate it. I knew the area really well. And the HOA was high because the neighborhood was so nice too. So yeah. it actually grew in value because of the HOA, which at that time I didn't like very much. Right, right, right. But, so yeah, it all worked out in the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you've definitely had a very interesting career from your, you know, start at Chase Bank, working with all these people, with them managing their finances, to then building your own team in such a short period of time, to owning so many rentals. You know, you've, you've, you're very experienced in that way. So congratulations on your success. Um, long may it continue. And you, you've set yourself some pretty big goals as well. You know, I think you put it on your Instagram. I can't remember where I saw it, to be honest with you. But do you want to share with everyone what your goal seeing as make it even bigger so that you have to stick to it? <laughs> yeah. So what I always learn is that when you put good things out in the world, good things happen to you, right? I think if you, if you share a lot of good positive vibes that the world or I guess the world has a way to kind of helping you. And that's how it is for me, right? So a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife and I were, well, this has been long planning, right? We decided that we are officially gonna retire August 12, 2024, and which is about, you know, less than, it's about three years now. So less than four years from today. Um, we decided that because again, it's like we mentioned earlier, right? We're not getting any healthier, right? And it's one of those things where I had family members that worked their butts off, right? Worked so much. And then when they retired at a, at a later age, well, literally a couple of years later, they get sick and then something happens and then, you know, they're not here anymore. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want that for us. And I felt like we made really good sacrifices and made really good decisions since we've been young. And why not take advantage of it? So I put that out on social media because it will hold you accountable too, right? And so it's one of those things, again, you put up good vibes. I think good things happen. I think if you're a good person, when you put out those good vibes, it just, it circles back. So now I know that hopefully people will be cheering me on my goals. And at the same time, I can, I can boost people and helping them, you know, to get to whatever goals they have in mind. Whether it's, you know, being a real estate agent, being a real estate investor, investing in the market, whatever it may be, you know, budgeting even, you know, as simple as that, right? So I feel like that, um, however, if we can help, we're gonna do it. And we're actually gonna start a new channel on YouTube um, by end of July. Okay. So we're gonna do the same thing. Um, it's, it's gonna be called Two Asians and a Dog. <laughs> so um, we're, we're on Instagram already. So that channel is gonna be about us learning, you know, having people learn how we got to where we are right now and what else we need to do uh, to be prepared to retire in about three years. So we're gonna go over you know, finances, real estate, traveling also, um, you know, do's and don'ts of just everything in life. And then, um, you know, just share a little story about us. Because I think that for the most part, we're pretty reserved, but we feel like we can help a lot of people. And every time we talk to family members or friends, we feel like we are helping people. So what if, what if you can times that by you know, 10 people, 20 people, 30 people, right? Because we feel like we're pretty normal people. We don't do anything crazy. We don't do anything extreme. We're just, we know, we know what we want and we know what it, what it takes to get there. As long as you have some discipline in your life, I think we can all do it. You know, especially with, you know, in today's world, I think like there's so many resources available for everyone. So that's why August 12, 2024, 
So hopefully everyone will, you know, stay in tune and just keep us on that straight and narrow to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see you get there. I'm, you know, I'm sure you'll get there a lot sooner, to be honest with you, you know, with, with the drive and determine that you ha- determination that you have and your willingness to help people, you know, I'm sure you'll get there a lot sooner. And uh, I'll definitely be a subscriber to your <laughs> channel for sure. I'm excited to see what kind of content you put out there. So I'm no, excited about that. Um, thank you so much for doing this and agreeing to do this. Um, it's been a great interview. We, again, we've We've gone for, I think, maybe 50 minutes. It's just flown by. I just Yeah, oh, wow. As, as always, I really enjoy talking to you. You know, it's great to have someone who loves talking real estate just like I do. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, before we go, do you want to let people know how they can get in touch with you? If someone's looking for a great agent in Las Vegas or if they're even thinking about maybe starting their um, career as an agent here in Vegas, how can they get a touch, hold of you and get in touch? Yeah, so I would say the best way is probably our website, um, jl12properties.com. So I'm on there. My entire team is on there. So again, with the whole team concept, um, whether you like me or not, you click on About Me, you can see all the agents on there, as long as you like one of them, right? That's all I'm all for. Um, obviously, you know, Facebook and social media or uh, Facebook and Instagram, I'm on there as well. Just search for my first and last name. And then again, our new YouTube, our new blog is coming out. So I'll be two Asians and a dog. So I'll be me and my wife and we have a white dog. So it makes cool. sense. I'll, I'll put out all that in the notes as well. So if anyone's trying to find you as well. Um, and for, just, just so that, not that I was hiding it, but my, I didn't, I didn't want to touch on it while we did it. My wife actually works for Joe and his team. So that's how we first, first met each other. But since then we've, we've connected through through uh interest in investing and everything financial and everything else in between yeah. as well but yeah my wife does work she, that's how i know what a good guy joe is and what a great leader he is and how much my wife enjoys being part of the team and how much he helps us so um thank you so much again like it's been a real fun a real privilege and a, a lot of fun to talk to you and i can't wait to talk to you again so thank you so much man all right sounds good barry i appreciate it we'll talk thank soon you. thank you yeah.